So, dear all, hello, we will start with the lecture five, which is about hydration. We will look, or I will give you a short overview of the reaction of cement clinker in Portland cements and similar cements, and then we will concentrate on the hydration modeling with GEMS. So, if we look on the hydration of cements, basically what happens, we have First, before we start hydration, we have to unreact the clinker, we add solution to it, then the clinker starts to dissolve, and we start to form a number of solids like etwingite, portlandite, and other phase, or CSH. If we want to model, then we need a number of things. We need some set of equation that describe the dissolution of the clinker phases, because as you've seen, or as you all know, the dissolution of the clinker phases is relatively slow. We have here in yellow the dissolution of a light, which continues maybe up for months and afterwards is getting quite slow. B light and ferrite are also relatively slow. So there's a number of different equations you might find in literature. And a very simple one, which works fine for most Portland cement, is the empirical approach of Parrot and Kilo, which has been published more than 30 years ago. Uh, basically, they just have a set of free equation, and the only thing we need as input is the composition, the surface area, and the water to cement ratio, and it's always the lowest of this equation, who sort of steers the cement reaction. You also can use any other set of equation you want. It is nothing to do with a real description of cement hydration, it's just an empirical law. We, in the original paper of Parrot and Kilo, which you also found on the, on the wiki, on the net, is was these values, and he gave them the names nucleation, diffusion, and shell. We think it's not the correct uh, labeling, but it doesn't really matter because it's just uh, an equation that works. And if we apply this equation and you have the, all that equation in an Excel sheet, which is also provided, then we sort of predict a behavior like that. And we also can look on the weight. It's not as nicely wound as we normally would expect, but it has a similar shape. And in the long term, it really predicts well. So it's good to use it in the long term. In the short term, it might be a bit, uh, you might make some errors. We also slightly adapted the original values of Parrot and Kilho because we had the feeling it, it fits better to our results. This is documented in this paper. And if you use that set of data, you can see, especially in the long term, we have a bit a higher degree of reaction, which fits much better what you observe in modern Portland cement. You also can apply that to all other uh, clinker phases like baylight, ferrite, and aluminate. And we actually had looked on two different cements, a Portland cement without limestone and a Portland cement with four limestone. And you've seen those data before. The second thing we need is naturally thermodynamic model. We heard a lot about that. We also need to think on our cement composition. We have A light, B light, aluminate, ferrite. We also have some other ions in this aluminate, B light, and A light, and ferrite. We have to think on that we have a number of soluble solids like alkali sulfate, gypsum anhydride, calcium oxide, and they will react immediately. So we will aim to restrain the reaction of those, will allow those phases to react immediately as they want. And we also have to take care of the water. If we do that, we can, for instance, predict Portlandite, we can predict the amount of uh, etringite, 
You see for the monocarbonate, it does not fit so well. We think there are two reasons. One is that it's not so easy to see all monocarbonate by XRD and because it's not so perfectly crystalline sometimes. And the other thing is we might form due to kinetics reason also some hemicarbonate, which is at least hemodynamically less stable than monocarbonate, but we still observe it. And we might have some aluminium in CSH, which we neglected in this calculation. There's also in the Excel sheet we will look at in a few minutes, there's also uh, temperature dependence. And basically we just used the Arrhenius equation and the Arrhenius equation says the rate of any chemical reaction depends on the temperature. If temperatures go up, the reaction is faster. If temperature goes down, the reaction is more slow. There's the so-called activation energy in it. This depends on the chemical element we look at, and this uh, basically describes how much faster or slower it will be. So this is just some example for five degrees, and you see the, the reaction of the alite is more slow. We only finished off the, the maybe two weeks. If we do it at 50 degrees, you see the alite reaction, if you just concentrate on that, is very fast. And we also have a fast reaction, a formation of Portland. Light. So this all works quite nice. It also works for the uh, aluminium, sulfate, and carbonate phases. We predict at low temperature a fast formation of etringite and some monocarbonate. And at 50 degrees, we predict that etringite is mainly present at the beginning and later it will be replaced by monosulfate because monocarbonate becomes unstable or the combination of etringite and monocarbonate becomes unstable at higher temperature. So before we start to do our modeling, I just want to, to emphasize again that the empirical approach of, Portland, of Parrot and Kilo works nice for most Portland cements. It describes the observed dissolution in particular at longer than one day. It's simple to use. We only need a few parameters. It's purely empirical. There's any model you can use, that's up to you. And you also have to be aware that influences of the pore solution like pH, alkali presence, sulfate presence are not included, mainly because at the moment we do not understand sufficient, those factors sufficiently. But eventually one day, I hope we will be able to do that. This is just an example of another model you might want to use for input. Here we have fitted the reaction of, of a fly ash, just using an equation like that. And then we told GEMS this is the amount of fly ash reacted as a function of time. And you can see the fly ash reaction is much, much slower than the, the clinker reaction. Maybe just some general, a few last general words. If you will, you, you, you have an Excel, which we look at in a second. And basically this is the mathematical expression of all the equation that have been present based on the paper of uh, Parrot and Kilo. And you can see how they affect. Here we have the temperature effect, we have the Arrhenius equation, we have the surface area, the original uh, model was, was uh, fitted for a surface area of 385. If we have a bigger surface area, it will be a bit faster. If we have a lower surface area, it will be slower. And also there's a factor to account for the influence of relative humidity. Normally, if we have, if we do the hydration in a closed system, then the relative humidity will be 100% or one. And so this is all fixed. And then we calculate for each time step the degree of hydration, basically taking the degree of hydration of the previous time step plus the difference in time multiplied by the weight we had at this time. 
and then just to make give you the complete picture picture at longer hydration times the hydration will slow down because we start to run out of water and this is taken care of by this age factor which which uh, slows down the hydration depending on the water cement ratio and the degree of reaction so you don't have to program all that it's all in this excel sheet you have gotten and basically what you can do you just can use the yellow parts as an input so the surface area the water cement ratio as I'm German speaking, I use the set for cement, while as an English speaking, you might want to use WC. The temperature in degrees Celsius, then I put here the amount, the weight, the weight percentages, and the relative humidity. Here you see the activation energies, just so you can look. And if you change any of these values, then here the values will be changed. And what you see here is the time in hours, the time in days, which we will use in GEMS, and then the amount of hydrated C3S, B light, aluminate ferrite. You see in the beginning it's very, very little, and if we would go for longer time, it would go up to maybe 60 or 60 grams aluminate. Um, a light reaction and over here you can see a plot of what's going on that's basically the amount of unreacted B light as a function of time if you open here your your file you will see a bit more details you will see a weight equation and you also see the parameters which we have used and I hope you have all found the Excel sheet to look at. Now, what do we want to do? Now, we have, I have pre-prepared a GEMS file for you where we can see all that. So I stop sharing this screen and I go to first share my general screen. Now, I share this one, that's easier. No, that was wrong. Um, you all got, you see now my, my screen, I guess. Correct? Yes. Good. Yes. You, you all got the folder additional information. In there, there's a folder hydration. In there, there's a folder parrot. And if you looked on the folder parrot, basically what we have, it's GEMS input file. And if you need to introduce that in GEMS, you can copy the folder, including the name, and don't change the name because it agrees with the name we have here. So you copy the folder and put the copied folder into your GEMS, basically in GEMS, in library, games free, projects, and there you have a lot of space, or you have all your projects listed, and I just can add one more, and then you see you have now the folder parrot. Then, if you have done that, you can go to open games. If you have games open when you do it, it will not see it, so you first have to close it, and then you can open it again. You can open it, and then you will see the file parrot now should be here and you can open it. And I hope you see now my GIMPs, correct? Okay, I guess you do. Uh, so what do I have here? I have here single systems and we have here process files. I first want you to look on the single system. In the single system, I have made an input. And if we look on this input, we can see we have a lot of things because it's a cement and cement is complex. 
We have the clinker phases, B light, aluminate, A light, ferrite. We have a bit of calcite. We have a bit of free lime. We have in this cement just gypsum, basically no anhydrite or hemihydrate. We have the alkali sulfates I have spoken of. We have a little bit of potassium oxides. We have magnesium oxide. We have, I put a little bit of oxygen to make sure we have oxidizing condition. We have sulfate and we have 40 grams of water because we had a solid to water ratio of 0.4. You also can see all the units are in gram and basically I normalized it to have 100 grams of cement and then I added 40 grams of water. If you calculate, you can see we obtain a lot of solid and very little aqueous phase. And we can see here in the same, if we look on the output, if we look on this one, we get four grams of water, one gram of gas, that's my, my O2 oxygen. Then we have 12 grams of hydrogarnet, 64 grams of CSH, some ettering guide, around 12 grams, some monocarbonate, some calcite, which has not reacted, and quite a lot of Portlandite, 33 grams, and a little bit of hydrotalcite. That's what we expect for such a cement, and this is the completely hydrated cement. And you also will see we don't have quartz or things like that because I have prohibited it as we did several times before. Now we want to see what's happening in the, in the process file. And basically the idea is to use that you have a process file that works for all your future hydration calculations. So you can always start from this one. You will see here on the mod C, we have the several columns for the input. The first one is the time, then that's the reaction of A light or the amount of A light reaction, reacted, of B light reacted and so on. And you will see these values correspond exactly to the values we had in the Excel sheet, basically to the values we have plotted here. So I just copied this time and the first and the first uh, five, basically the first, these five columns into my GEMS file. Then if we look on this one, I have here the temperature, 20 degrees. I have the number of steps it can make up to 500. It only makes 148, so that's fine. The pressure, one bar. And then we have here a title, hydration of PC. Periton Kilo adopted by Lothenbach et al. 2008. Then we have here some comments. Always if we have the dollar sign, it's a comment. Periton Kilo, clinker phases from Bohr calculation or wherever you got it. Cement specific input, surface area, uh, 413 square meter per kilogram, the water to cement ratio. Again, I wrote a Z instead of a C, uh, the amount of C3S in grams. So basically, if you have another cement, you have, can adapt that. But remember also to adapt it in the Excel sheet because else you will get inconsistent results here and here. The amount of B light, the amount of aluminate, the amount of ferrite, calcite, free lime, gypsum, anhydrite. And if we go down, uh, hemihydrate, bosonite, arcanite, tenodite, as well as periclas. That's the magnesium oxide. I have added here also some coefficients for the uptake, for the presence of alkali in my cement. This is something you must know for your own cement if you want, or you also can neglect it depending on what you prefer. Then here I have listed the activation energy and here it says no changes necessary in this part of the script. It means if you have a good reason, go to change it. 
If you don't have any reason, just leave it how it is. So we have here activation energies. It's from the paper of Lothenbach et al. We have here an expression that calculates the amount of A light reacted, the same for B light, aluminate, ferrite. We have an uh, expression that recalculates water to solid ratio to amount of water. We have a correction factor for the impurities, which is normally around 0 .0, uh, 0 0.99 or something like that. We have we calculate the upper limit of a light reaction. The oh sorry, the lower limit of unreacted a light. So basically, the DLL C3S tells us the lowest limit of unreacted B light uh, a light has to be depends on the time, depends on the amount of reacted B light a light, and then we have an expression to take care of the minor element from the dissolution of the cement. We can look on the sampling. On the sampling, we have here the LG mod, say, G0, that's our time in days. Then we have the x-axis, and here you see we have the amount of A light, we have the amount of B light, and so on. And at the end, we also have the amount of aqueous phase. We can look on the results, or if we want to have more fun, or oh, maybe first we have to look on the results. Here we see the amount of unreacted clinker. So we have A light, B light, aluminate. That's our original cement. In the beginning, we have no CSH. However, we have some Portlandite. Basically, we have Portlandite because we had free lime in our system. And as soon as we put free lime into contact with solution, we will start to form Portlandite. We also have gypsum present because we had it initially present. We have a bit of calcite present, no ettringite, no AFM phases, and a little bit of prusite because we had periclass a little bit in our input, and this will react immediately to prusite. And naturally, we have poor solution. So now I want to calculate. Let's see what's happening. I wanted to show the graphs. And you can see here we have a x axis, days. I put the logarithmic x axis because it's much easier to see it that way. And then we have the masses put here. And so basically, we can see how it calculates. We also can see what's happening. We have A light here. We might have ferrite here. We have aluminate here. And we would have B light. We can continue with CSH, Portlandite. We have in the beginning a little bit of gypsum. Then we start to form. Etringite, we have some calcite present, which also its amount decreases with time. We might form some monocarbonate. We don't form hemicarbonate, nothing of that. We form a little bit of hydrotalcite. And finally, we also form some siliceous hydrocarbonate and we have poor solution. So you have a hydrated cement as a function of time. Any questions to that for the moment? There's some more explanation in the script. And that's where we were. Did it work for everybody? So everybody fine. Then I will continue to explain. And afterwards, at the end, there's a little example you might want to do yourself. So uh, just to explain again, 
the, the architecture of the games file, you also have this last page config where you could look on each of the calculation steps separately, what we did yesterday already. Uh, on the output, I already said we have this X axis in lock because else it's difficult to see something. The Y axis, as we put it up, was always gram per 100 gram of hydrated cement. If you do experiments, you might not get that format. It depends a bit. If you do Rietveld, you will recalculate to get all your results to a gram of 100 gram cement. But for sometimes you might get different options. And one thing is the mass corrected option, which is already in your file. And there you also have the option, if you go on the right hand side of your, of your screen, to see the axis labeled. And I can change my screen and go to this one. I have it prepared here, save changes. And I, I, you see here, I have one that is called mass corrected. If we click on the input, you can see it's all the same. If we click on the sampling, I have added an expression and I will explain that expression in a second. If we click on the results, you see here, I have the calculated results. And if I go to the right hand side, I basically have a table for experimental data. So again, I have the time, I had to convert it in, ten, in a logarithmic scale. And then I had the amount of unreacted A light, B light, ferrite, ettringite, and so on. If I do that, I can plot all these things together. So you see, this is my calculated line, and uh, this is my experimental line. And if we look very much on the details, you will see here, I defined a line for my calculated data. And if I look for my experimental data, I just put the line size of zero and the bigger simple size to enable or to make it a bit easier for comparison. How does it look up like in the setup? We can check, check that if we click on the remake record data button on the tool thing. Then we just see what I did. I left the input. I changed the output. And I added here a number of, number of rows for experimental data and number of columns for experimental data. So what I did, I made nine columns and allowed 24 rows into it. And that's where I stored my experimental data, which you can find here. If I do that, now let's go back to my presentation. If I do that, I get somewhat a different amount. I had this uh, correction term, which says one plus the amount of the water to solid ratio minus the amount of water that remains unreacted. And then I normalize it back to 100%. This is basically the mass of hydrated cement after the removal of pore water. And this we can use for comparison with XOD and TGA data. Um, maybe to make it more clear, I put up this picture. If you start with your cement, you have 100 grams of solid and 40 grams of water. That's easy. If you let it hydrate for a day or two, you might have 130 grams of solid because you start to make the hydrates and 10 grams of water. Normally you stop hydration, so you remove these 10 grams and you just have the 130 grams left, which are now your new 100%. But this is not the same 100% as you had here, where you only had 100 grams. And we can calculate that back to the dry weight by using the TGA data, basically by using the mass or correcting for the bound water we had in the sample. 
and then we can compare it to the not corrected values if we want to do that. So basically what I want to say, there are two options on calculating mass. Either you refer everything directly to unhydrated cement, and then your experimental data also have to refer to unhydrated cement, or you correct GEMS to correspond to the hydrated cement, and then you can use your experimental data directly. It's equivalent, it just depends on how you have your experimental data. There's also some discrepancy you can see here. We have experimentally, because we did X on D, we have something which we call amorphous. And if we compare it to CSH, you see we have a bit less CSH. The reason for that is that there's a number of phases which are not so easily to be observed by XRD. It's not only CSH, it's also hydrotalcite and many of the AFM phases. So it's quite common to have less CSH predicted than we, the, the amorphous observed. Questions to that? Is there? Yes. <laughs> Um, for the hydrate cement, it's a quite complete system and more than one amorphous phase. Uh, yes. You mean CSH or some uh, half of the HCMC etching guy? Yeah. And mm -hmm. if we add the CS, uh, SCMs, um, we, we have the amorphous slag or met calling. It's really a quite complicated yes. uh, system. Um, yes. Um, but my question is, can we just calculate all the crustal feeds, ignore all the amorphous feeds? Yes, yes, can yes. We you. Make sure, can we make sure the result is right? I think the calculation results, oh, I, I guess both the calculation and the XRD were, are right. We just don't always get the the same thing. Sorry, maybe I didn't understand your question. Um, my my question is, uh, it have the amorphous phase and the crustal phase. Can we uh, see? Can we ignore the amorphous part just to see our results about the crustal phase? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. 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 That's that's also what gave us a bit confidence that we did the things right. For instance, we can look on the Portlandite and what we predict, yeah, so, what we measured is fine. So sometimes I only get the the CSC, uh, C3A, C3S phase or some mm, like gypsum mm -hmm. etching guide and some crustal phase. I think that means a lot. Yes, yes. And the modeling will give you both the crystalline and the amorphous phase, and some of your experiments you might only see a part of it. Yeah, but yeah, especially in the in my system contains more than one SCMs. Okay. And CSH. Okay. It's quite complicated. Yes, there's also there will be an example to I think on modeling the reaction of fly ash in a in a Portland cement. So maybe you think about doing that exercise. Yeah, which might help that's you. my point. Yeah, I, I noticed that, that uh, uh, work. Yeah. And uh, my another question is, uh, I know the Professor Karen's group. Yes. They did lots of the mass, ba mass balance calculation works. Yes. What do you think about the FTHCMC phase? Okay, it's, uh, I think in the end, GEMS and any other system is also doing mass balance. So the results should be similar. Why do they not use GEMS? Because sometimes or not all, sometimes they don't know how to adapt. Because for instance, sometimes the, the CSH composition is maybe not one calcium to silica 1.6, but yeah. they measure yeah. 1.4 even though yeah. they still have Portlandite. And the GEMS, GEMS will always predict 1.6, as long as you have Portlandite. So they wanted to adapt it to their observation. You have two options, you can use mass balance, and you have to do a lot of work, 
or you can tell GEMS to do it for you. But then you must know GEMS very well. But we can try to figure out how to do that when you do your exercise. I can show you how to do it. So, um, so it, it should be equivalent whether you do it in GEMS mm -hmm. and maybe correct yeah, for, more for than one method. Yeah, there's more than one method. So, they don't contradict, they should be consistent. Do you think it's reliable when I just uh, use the mass balance calculation to measure the HCMC feeds in a system contains SCM? I think as long as we are on the Portland I, on the Portland cement which end, and as long as we stay at ambient temperature, it works fine. Don't do okay. the mass balance if you go to higher temperature because you will get different phases and you will not okay. take that into account. And don't use it if you go to really different system where there's no CSH and nothing, yeah. then it will fail. Or okay, we, we, look you, at, we look at it how to do it in games. It can be done. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Hello, Babaha. Hi. Yes, uh, I have a question about the heat of hydration. Yes. You know, during, in, in this model, we will take the temperature into a into condition, mm -hmm. uh, but we just see the temperature as a constant. We don't change the temperature. Yes. But, but in fact, uh, during hydration, the mixture will release heat, the temperature will rise, will change all the time. So how can we handle this problem? Uh, at the moment, we never, we never did it. We could, I'm sure it could be possible, but I wouldn't know in the moment on how to do it. What we normally do if we study hydration, we actually do our experiments isothermal. We I use see. We, we use small like containers. In engineering, the temperature will change all the time, you know. Yes, yes, As, especially if you go for, for, for uh, concrete and big blocks and all that. Yes. 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 This is another kind of calculation and I would know at the moment how to solve it, but I'm sure we could, but uh, it's not, not nothing I can take out of my head now. But naturally, it's also, even if you heat up your cement, it will mainly change the kinetics. And then in the long term, yes. it normally will go back to 20 degrees. And as soon yes, as you will be back to, to oh, ambient temperature, whatever that might be. And as soon as you <laughs> go back, all the hydrates will go back to that. But naturally, you will change these kinetics. This. There's no doubt. That's a good question. And I guess it will take a lot of time to, 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 to teach that to games on how to do that. I see. No, no, at the moment and it's really done for isothermal conditions. I see. Other questions? If not, then let's go on. Uh, we also can sample the aqueous concentration. You have it on your input. We will change to games in a second. And basically, we collect the aqueous phase just in a further process file. And we collect it again using a logarithmic scale because it's easier to watch it. We have here the total concentration. And then this is just a small detail. Up to now, we always just used the total concentration and we didn't worry too much about the units. But basically the units in GEMS are molal and not molar. What does molal mean? Molal means it's all related to one kilo of H2O. While when we, while when we measure by IC, we normally measure by mole per liter solution. So it's nearly the same thing, but it can have a small difference normally within the range of one or two percent. If we want to calculate 
uh, mole per kilo H2O into mole per lit, we can use this kind of expression. Basically, this says it's the amount of H2O we have in solution in moles. Then we multiply it by the molar weight for, of water, so we get kilo H2O, and then we divide it by the volume of the solution, volume H2O again, which then gives us liter of solution, so we get from molar to molar. And then we have a factor of 1000, because I want to have it in millimole per liter and not in mole per liter. I can tell you the difference is really small, but sometimes you might want to make it extra correct, and then you can add that equation. And if we do that, that's on the results page, you can see, for instance, the, the, the potassium concentration, the sodium concentration, the hydroxide concentration. What you always see in Portland cement is initially high sulfate and calcium concentration, which then decrease at the moment when uh, we are depleted of calcium sulfate. You also can calculate carbonate concentration, which we didn't measure. We can calculate silica and aluminium concentration. You will see in tendency the data agree, agree with what we have measured. However, there are some minor differences, which indicates we still have to work a bit on our database. And you can find it here in your file. If you look on the solution part, and basically that's the same picture as I showed you before, or we can do the calculation and nothing will change. So basically I used three times the same input and just changed the output file to have the option to look on different aspects of my file. And it all looks the same as it did before. And naturally, you can label the whole thing. I'm not sure whether this, yeah, okay, that was wrong. If I mislabel, I just can take the aluminium again and put it to the proper place. Or I can label calcium, I can label potassium and so on. And naturally, you also could select other things you want to calculate. Now, I want one of you to do an exercise together and basically where we calculate the volume of the phases and I need a volunteer. Oh, there's some hints. And maybe we first look on the hints. We duplicate the process mass, we exchange pH mass by pH volume and it's normally a clever thing to use any editing software, Word or whatever you prefer, and that's it. And this is just for general information. If you don't want to use pH wall, we also could divide it by the mass of components and multiply it by the volume of components. But it's much easier to use the pH wall expression. Now, who wants to do the exercise for all of us? Any volunteers? Professor, I can do it. Yeah, that's great. So share your screen. Okay. So you, can you show us how to duplicate the record? Yes. Yes. Now you have to give it volume two or something. Yes, perfect. Good. And then normally it's the best not to change anything because everything was already well thought through. Okay. And uh, yes, as soon as you press the, the save button, it will appear. Okay, now up to you. Yes. 
yes, you can either type it in or you can uh, copy and paste it in or you can export everything into a Word file and copy it back. That's all equivalent. And concentrate very much when you do that because if you make any typing error, games will give you error messages. Okay, that's all right. Yes, this, I think this, uh, yeah, that's all perfect. If you go to the results, there's one little thing you might want to change on the upper left corner. Basically, you can change the, the units. You have to go up left, or up maybe left. it's, yeah, even more up. Oh, here, here, here. I can show you where it is. Comment. Here you have the. Here you can write okay. state volume instead of mass or what you want. Good. Now we calculate and see what's happening. The good thing is there's no mm -hmm. error messages. So you probably did a lot of things correct, I guess. And now let's have a look on the results on the picture. Yes. I think that looks beautiful. Yes, you want to adapt the scale. Okay. And you can label your, your things and I think it was well done. Did everybody get the same thing or anybody got major problems? Sorry, Professor, I have another question. Yes, sure. Uh, so uh, how to use this button, uh, remake? You always can use the remake. Just press on it, don't worry. Okay. Uh, it will ask you whether oh. you, and then Okay, you can change the things. I often use it, for instance, if you go next. Next. I often use it to change, for instance, the amount of output columns and things like that. Then I go to next again. If you start to change things here, yes. Uh, okay, if you go one back, if you start to, to change thing in the modeling part, it will remove anything you already have there. So I normally yeah. avoid to do that. But if you go to the next, then often I might think that, uh, or I might realize that I need more columns to keep my results in and things like that. And so, for instance, if you put now there 24 instead of a 20, we can see what's happening. Oh. Yes, don't worry, nothing, nothing bad will happen. Then we press next. <laughs> and here you also can say, see whether you're safe, your calculations or not, because sometimes I cannot remember whether I saved it or not. Then you press next. Finish. And now if you click on the process button here, and we go 
here on the results page, if you go more to the right, on the on here more to the right, uh, you have to uh, you have to go in here in any of this, and then use the. Okay. Yes. Okay, that's the other option. And now you have made four new columns with no data in it. But uh, if you want to use yeah, more, 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 more plots or things like that, it's handy. Yeah, okay, thank you. Good. Any other questions or comments? Okay, then, stop. Yes, you can stop sharing. Then maybe I want to share one more thing with you, which we didn't have in the in the presentation. Now we've made all this nice hydration. Oh, sorry, I have to share first my screen. So uh, I guess you see now my games again, correct? Yes. Um, now we calculated it for one cement but maybe you want to calculate it for another cement. So how can we duplicate a GEMS file? There is one easy trick. We go to the database mode. Then we go to open, but we select here, create a new project using the selected one as template. Oh, it would say it if we could see all of the text. Then we look for our powered file. And then after we made this one, we can press new project. So it will use the existing project as a, as a template. So we, it asks for a name, so I can call it power two. You can call it anything you want. I call it test. Then you press okay. Then it asks you whether it should use the database, but we can actually deactivate it because the database we have used is already in the project, except if we want to add some more things, but I don't want to do it. If you want to add things, yes, sure, then you have to activate some database. Let me press next. Then it tells us again which elements it had. Now we cannot select, makes no sense to select more elements because we have deactivated all database. Then we press next and then we need a little bit of patient. It will ask us for the inactivity model. We leave it how it is. We press okay. And then we have a new file. We can see whether it calculates. And then now, we have a whole new process where we can change our cement composition if we want to, or do whatever else. That's the easiest way to duplicate systems. So that was cool, wasn't it? Another thing you might want also use for the exercises later is we had this this um, in the process file we had this way to make an input like time unreacted a light b light and so on if you have a closer look at it then we have at column five which i basically have used to store some of the things from my input. And we have a column six, which is completely unused. This is a column which you also can use to, for instance, to store the amount of reacted SCMs, like reacted fly ash. And then you just have to add here a thing like, uh, I don't know, my X, so, it might get something, we, we might could add something like, uh, now I have to make it properly, add fly ash. So I could use XA fly ash if I would have defined it, which I haven't done in this exercise. 
I could say this is equal mod C. Okay, so we C. So we mod C. J C six or something like that. And naturally then I would have to put some data in it. But this only works if I first define a Farage in Compass and so on. But I'm sure you 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 get the idea. Now I remove that again to avoid to kill my file. And that's also a good thing. You can try in a new file because if something goes wrong, you always can go back to the old file. Maybe one more general thing for you and the future use of GEMS. It's if you use GEMS regularly, make sure to back up the GEMS folder also regularly, basically by copying somewhere on a second drive as well. Maybe once a day or once a week, because it can be that you kill your, your, your projects. Basically, you, you, you do something which gives a big house in, in, in the process or the project somewhere, and then it does not want to open anymore. So if you do backups, you just can copy basically back the latest version, you know, it still was working and doing it again. Any more question to the hydration?